Hi, my name is Deborah Sosawar. I'm the Marketing and Communications Manager here at Aramont School of Arts and Crafts. Welcome to today's roundtable discussion. Uh, the original discussion took place on March 19th in 2021, and there were some technical difficulties which resulted in the first part of the recording uh, not being recorded. So um, I'm really grateful to the three artists who you see joining me here today who graciously agreed to reintroduce themselves um, to make the recording complete for you now. Um, I also want to take a moment to remember the victims of last week's violent attack in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, it impacts all of us, particularly the Asian American and Pacific Islander community who were targeted um, in the attacks. Um, I'm still reeling from the events, but I want to say that having conversations like this, particularly focusing on this topic of craft and spirit, um, it brings us together in powerful ways and it helps us process what, it, what it's like to move forward, hopefully in a positive way, um, bringing light in a dark time through forging community through these kind of conversations here with these artists. And I really appreciate that you're part of this, uh, this discussion by watching today's recording. So um, the program started in July of 2020, this series of videos and conversations aimed to highlight the talented artists who teach at Aramont, introduce new ideas in contemporary craft, and strengthen the connections in our community. Today, I'm talking with three talented artists who are all gonna teach at Aramont this year. So let me quickly introduce our panelists and then they will give you a more full-fledged introduction of themselves. Um, I'm joined by Rachel Garceau, who's a studio artist and educator based in Atlanta, Georgia, a former Aramont resident, um, I have Maria Sarmiento, a mixed media sculptor and educator, also joining us from Atlanta, although today she's in Abagosa, Colombia. Very nice to have you here, Maria. And Dietlin Vanderskaff is a painter and instructor um, based in Portland, Maine. So I'm going to turn it over to our panelists so that they can introduce themselves, and then we'll get started in the discussion. And I will say that at some point in this video, you will stop seeing me and you will start to see Kelsey Dillo, who is our gallery manager, who moderated the original discussion on the 19th. Thank you very much. Um, really happy to be a part of this conversation. And, um, you know, this is something, a topic that I think a lot about. And as mm -hmm. my practice evolves, both in the area of studio work and um, my own spiritual practice, I um, keep continue to see ways that they overlap and intersect. And so it's really exciting to uh, talk about this with a group of folks. Um, so to go a little bit to the origin story of both of these practices, they kind of came together at a similar time. Um, I was uh, I have a um, an undergraduate degree in fine arts with a concentration in ceramics and had been pursuing that for some time after I finished school and then reached a point where I was searching for different ways of working. I couldn't quite get clay to do what I wanted it to do in, in particular ways. And so I went to Penland School of Crafts in North Carolina for two years as a core fellow to explore different methods and materials and ways of working. And it was during that time that I discovered mold making and I discovered I could make very precise forms out of a variety of materials or out of found objects um, and then make molds and cast them and turn them into porcelain. And so in a way, it's sort of like I found myself feeling like I was the Midas of porcelain. I could turn anything into porcelain. And um, so that's the, where my work is really rooted for the last um, eight or 10 years. And that's also the class that I'll be teaching at Aramont this summer in June is uh, mold making. So well, it'll be aimed towards slip casting, but we'll also cover um, some other types of things like casting paper and, and other materials. Um, so during that time at Penland, I also deepened my yoga practice. There's um, every two weeks throughout the summer, along with instructors coming into each studio, Penland hires a movement instructor and is typically a yoga instructor. And it's in a lot of ways, I think, because Penland believes and understands that our tool, our most important and irreplaceable tool as makers is our bodies. And so they offer an opportunity 
twice a day for folks to come in and sort of refresh and um, not only bodies, but minds in a really concentrated time. And during those two years, I really appreciated and utilized that and mostly as a, a pulse in my day, but also as um, you know, a way to take care of my body. And, but then I realized that there was something else going on. The deeper I went into the practice, the more I practiced, the more I realized that there was something else going on. And I really wanted to explore that and find out more about it. So right after I finished the fellowship, I spent a month in India getting my 200 hour uh, yoga teacher certification. And it was there that I went deeper into meditation, into use of mantra and, and things of that nature. And returning to the studio after that time, um, spent a year at Aramont as a resident artist and began to incorporate some of those things into the studio practice using mantra as a way to connect repetitive actions in the studio. And, um, and also while I was at Aramont, I was able to share through teaching yoga each day before dinner, I would offer an hour yoga class. And so I was very much had those two practices happening simultaneously, but kind of apart from one another. And so since then, in the last several years, I've been exploring more how they overlap, more how they intersect, more how I can sort of create spaces through the work that I make that allow people to maybe access a deeper place within themselves. And I think we'll talk more about that as we go along in the conversation today. And um, just a little bit, I'm looking at the piece that you're looking at now. And there's something here that's really going into the topic of repair and of healing and of sort of what it means to occupy space and to be vessel. So I'll leave, leave it at that for now. Well, um, my name is Maria Sarmiento. I am a sculptor um, from Colombia, living in Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, uh, my work has uh, progressed and changed in so many different ways using different variety of materials. Um, this piece that you see here uh, is made out of cement and it's very heavy, it's 700 pounds. And um, uh, the, the material itself, like the core is some uh, insulation foam. Uh, but I was always looking for another material that allowed me to um, build something like that, less heavy and take in more time. And my, um, my pieces in reality um, wanted to explore that ability to uh, do lightweight. So I found this wonderful product called Paltaya Premium. And it allows, it has the durability and strength of cement, but also is flexible and pliable as clay. So that is the workshop that I will be teaching in, in Aramont uh, at the uh, first week of June. Um, and you can do and build different types of armatures and things uh, with it. Um, and it's non-toxic, something that I really, really love. Um, and uh, you can do like different styles, like mine is semi-abstract style, and you can add different finishes um, to it. Like in here, you see some um, a coating, uh, metal coating on the blue part. And also afterwards, uh, uh, what you see in color, that is mosaic. That has been one of the things that I've been adding to my pieces. So um, there is a lot of uh, interesting things with uh, that material. Um, I, I've been working different series in my studio practice, and I have, um, this one is another Paltaya piece, um, very small, uh, it's like probably 20 inches tall. So in this, I um, added that finish and um, added glass, and mosaic has been another exploration. I like the voids and holes on my pieces, kind of like making it look like you are trying to lean or they are looking at you. 
And uh, lately I've been adding a lot of natural um, elements and working with some resin and kind of like creating all of these different elements um, in nature uh, and inspired by nature. Uh, my work is uh, based on, on transcendence and spiritual place that we are in the universe and kind of that quest of where we are and where we are going. So um, that is an exploration of different um, series, as I mentioned. Uh, one is um, a, the cosmic series. The other one is about elements, nature, and that is the one that I'm currently working on. And this piece is um, the uh, fully built in Paltaya. And uh, the piece was very easy to build and very fast. Um, I build it vertical, uh, uh, like cement, it will take you forever. I built this very, very quickly on, uh, I did like two layers on it. And also the other interesting thing is that you can sand it off. You, you can create a smooth finish with it after a, kind of like have the first stage of curing. And when it cures, it can withstand a very strong temperature. So it's perfect for any outdoor thing, or you can do it indoor. It's up to you and it's very easy to work and you can even do it in your own kitchen. So you don't have to have a large studio or build something that big at all. Um, so I, I have a lot of different interests. And when I was um, in undergraduate, I studied history. I studied um, art history and um, American studies. I went on to earn a, a master's degree in American studies. And then I moved to California and pursued an MFA in creative writing, which was um, a passion of mine. And while I was in graduate school for writing, um, I saw a painting that I fell madly in love with. Um, it was called Night Train to Amsterdam. And I started taking classes on the side um, from this particular artist and fell in love with collage and did that while going to graduate school and working full time and evolved a whole, um, a whole uh, process there with narrative collage, which I taught for many years and really thoroughly enjoyed. And gradually my, um, the words began to disappear from my work and then my work became more abstract. And along the way, I saw my first encaustic painting. Um, encaustic is a form of painting that's done with molten pigmented beeswax. And I fell completely in love with this kind of um, medium because it allows you to paint in a way that sort of straddles painting and sculpture. Um, I can build up many, many layers. I can paint and um, have layers show through. I can carve into the work. So it's very satisfying, very tactile um, medium to work with. Um, so I have been teaching this particular technique for about 10 years and um, so how, do, how does this intersect with my interest in spiritual practice? So um, I go back to being about 19 years old uh, when I first um, encountered a yoga class around the same time that I had um, a really wonderful therapist who is a Japanese uh, Buddhist and who had a community Sangha as part of his practice. And so uh, every Sunday we would gather for two hours of um, meditation. And this was really my first experience with, um, with meditation and yoga. And they became things that were really important to me in my life as ways to um, cope with anxiety. And when I turned 40, about six years ago, I decided that I wanted to pursue um, that practice a little bit deeper. And I did a teacher training similar uh, to Rachel and did a 200 hour training and then returned back to uh, further that. Um, I have one more module to get my 500 hour certification, uh, but haven't been able to do that because of the pandemic. Um, when I went through that teacher training, I saw that my artwork changed pretty significantly where um, before that it was a more static, um, a more neutral palette. Um, as a result of going through this training, I found that um, my work kind of exploded. It became more colorful, um, more gestural, and that 
that was really a special, a special experience for me. And, and as a result, I began to bring some elements of um, that training into the classroom as a way to talk about um, our art making practices and also to occasionally lead yoga as part of my workshops. Um, the, the workshop that I'm going to be offering at Aeromont next November is a layers translucency and see-throughs class, which is what I kind of consider to be my specialty, which is building layers, uh, drawing between layers, creating paintings that have a sense of optical depth and dimension that you can sort of see down into. Dylan, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, Okay, well, now I get to open up to you guys to talk more about um, craft and spirit. Rachel, do you want to start off the conversation with with the question that was still you were you've been still thinking about? Yeah, so one of the topics that we had um, been thinking about talking about but didn't have time on Friday to get to was a connection to to nature in our work and um, and how how that relates. I don't know, Maria, do you have the original question there? Uh, yeah, let me put it at, it says, um, oh, if each, each of you, if each of you reference nature in your work, either through inspiration, form, site specific installations, outdoor sculpture, etc. Talk a bit about how nature relates to the spiritual in your work or otherwise. Should I get the ball rolling since I brought it up? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's, it's um, you know, I, I sort of hit a, a variety of those points that are in the question, both in terms of the inspiration for the work and also the location that where the work exists. And, um, and for me, it's the, what will happen for me is I'll be walking along and I'll see something probably on the ground or in front of me somewhere that's, that I just am drawn to for a reason that I don't understand. And then I, if it's, you know, something like a seed or a nut or something that I feel like I can bring home with me, I will bring it home with me. If it's something that I feel like needs to stay where it is, I'll just take pictures of it. And then often it will sort of become this obsession, you know, I'll just sort of look at the thing or look at the images and just sort of wonder like, what is, what? what is going on there? Why am I so deeply drawn to this thing? And so then I'll maybe start to draw it, start to make smaller sculptures of it, just start to sort of pull the essence out of it. And it's rarely for me that I want to recreate the thing. It's about kind of exploring what is the essence of the form or what is the essence um, that that's drawing me to the thing. And then through the process of sculpting, casting, again, in the process of casting, there's this repetition. So I'm seeing the form repeated over and over and over again. And so I'm getting to experience it over and over and over. And it's kind of, I mean, that sort of connects into this like meditative thing that we're talking about in the, in the studio. Um, and then ultimately I tend to find a clarity. I tend to it sort of reveals to me what it was trying to tell me. So it's like this really beautiful sort of mystery um, and then and then revealing. And, and it's, uh, there's this beautiful children's book called The Other Way to Listen. And, um, and I think that this is another way to listen. It's sort of like listening to nature through absorbing it, looking at it, being with it, recreating it, pulling the essence of it, and then viewing it again through how it's been translated through my mind and my hands, and then learning from it in that way. Yeah, I, I could jump in on that because I feel like the way that you explain that, particularly at the end, Rachel, I really resonate with. And that is that I feel like as an artist, um, for me, a lot of it is about the role of observation 
And I'm when to be in the natural world, to be to hike, hiking is my favorite thing to do, to go walking in the White Mountains. And I, I used to work in the White Mountains years ago. And I just to be outside on any kind of a path is my favorite thing. Um, moving through the woods, you know, there's that that concept of forest bathing, which I love because mm -hmm. to me, it's like the 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 negative ions. I'm not sure what's happening physiologically, but there's a way that you can access your breath that I feel like my shoulders soften, that I relax, um, that my, my soul is settled in the natural world. And so it's very important to me to have, to maintain that connection. And that's also like the way I try to experience being in the studio too. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't always happen that way. I mean, we have our challenging days in the studio for sure when things aren't going the way we want them to. But I see that my, um, my, the work that I'm trying to create, even though it's abstract, it, there's elements of landscape, there's elements of, um, of the man-made landscape as, you know, the urban environment, as well as the natural world. Um, really what I'm trying to create is this feeling tone that I get from being in the world, from looking and synthesizing and processing and digesting and celebrating the beauty that I see there. And so for me, the element of spiritual practice, the way that that comes in is that it's about how can I be more and more present? How can I cultivate awareness? How can I listen and observe very, um, how can I observe the world and then translate that, uh, through myself to my, my hands, to the work that I make. And with teaching, I think there's a similar role, which is that, you know, we're, we're being very present with our students. We're listening very deeply as much as we're conveying or, um, sharing knowledge. We're also trying to be super present to hear what they're saying and what they're not saying at the same time. And so I, I, I don't see it as a separate, I see it as intricately like this, this braid, all these things are woven together. Yeah. Um, for me, um, I was, um, raised here in Colombia and my parents had a farm, so weekends was farm, vacation was farm. So, um, and then, you know, like, well, I moved to the States and farm was so far away, but I always look at going into nature as a healing process, kind of like I needed somehow it's part of me. And lately, you know, like with the years, kind of like you get more clarity in your mind. And I discovered I'm not a citizen, I am more a farm girl to a heart. So for <laughs> me, nature, animals, um, anything like that, when I was playing in the farm, it was not all, all of these plastic toys. It was like, okay, go outside and play. So mm -hmm. I was climbing trees. Uh, I made forks out of sticks that had like the three point, and that was my fork. And I was picking up leaves in the ground and it's like, oh, this is my salad, you know? <laughs> it was very, very much like the imagination was totally immersed with what it was there. And, you know, like I climbed trees and this is my house and this branch is my bedroom and lay there and pretend that I was going to sleep and all of those things. So for me, nature has been my healer, I will say, and is more what I feel connected with. So... In my practice, uh, the spiritual part is like kind of that inner growth, that thinking of we are part of this and how we are part of this and thinking of like ancient people tend to be more, I, I, I would say sophisticated, but simplifying instead of complicating, instead of adding so much um, that we have today is like the rush. Uh, you need to do more you need to do this big list you need to do and do and do this there is never enough and for me right now i'm reaching that place of is like no there is, has to be an undo list mm -hmm. i need to do something that is essential that is important that is nurturing that is me not what the world is telling me to be mm -hmm. and that part is coming from that nature like when i was playing i didn't have all the toys i had me, nature, flow, something more deeply connected. The other things make me feel disconnected. Mm -hmm. So um, in my practice, I love going in walks, like what, what you guys say. And I have tons of photos that I don't know what I'm going to do with them. But I think they are somehow somewhere that I don't know where or where it's coming from or ancestral blood, genes, God knows what. 
is processing and chewing that part in. And lately um, I've been taking, like I've been doing a small domes because my sculptures are so big, but now I'm making domes that are that small. Mm -hmm. And my daughter was like, oh mom, you love nature. Why don't you take them to the woods? And I've been taking them and putting them in holes in the trees, besides mm -hmm. moss, in creeks and taking photos, kind of like, I took inspiration and elements from it, but I am going back. Kind mm -hmm. of like, it's like a whole cycle of belonging and becoming, or I don't know, I'm, I'm in the journey. So I let you know later. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can relate to that too. A lot of my work in the installations exist outdoors and found locations in nature often. And I feel like that too, it's sort of like, um, like a, Gifting maybe is a strong word, but just um, maybe in gratitude, right? Like bringing, like thanking for the inspiration, bringing back to to sort of reflect in in the environment. Or you can think of a, this one piece that I made um, where there was this tree growing along a rock that overhung a river. And it, its root had grown in such a way that it basically made this big loop and had this big void. And so I had been making pieces that kind of had this similar like long, but with a curl at the end, thinking about tangles and entanglement and um, people's lives intersecting and interweaving. And then I saw that reflected in this tree. And so it was like a collaboration where I was like, oh, I'm making these sort of, it's like a macro micro situation where it's able to sort of fill its void with many similar things that were like it and just for a moment you know just for like two days and then and then remove it so just the real honoring of what I was seeing by sort of collaborating with it mm -hmm. it makes me think that you guys are engaging in like an artistic photosynthesis <laughs> right like you're you're taking in nature and it either is very apparent in the placement of your work or in the inspiration for your work. And then through the process of your artistic practice, you synthesize it and then it, you release it back into the ecosystem. <laughs> so yeah. and it becomes actually um, uh, beneficial to the ecosystem too, right? Not something that interferes, but something that adds. So, yeah. Um, do you guys think, I'm kind of, I'm personally curious when you're making work, is spirituality a term or a title that you assign? Have you, is that something you've assigned to your own practice and thought about, or is that something that gets assigned to it by others? Like, is, does that make sense as a question? Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that makes sense. I can, I can jump in. Hopefully I'm not still muted. Now, <laughs> now I have that fear of being <laughs> muted. Um, I, I don't use the word spirituality as much as I use the word contemplative practice. Um, I think I don't, there's not a specific reason. That's just the word that comes to mind. And I think of it like, like contemplative practice, sort of like I think about yoga off the mat, like this is something that extends. It's like what I do and how I work on myself, um, which, you know, we're, I'm a work in progress, like an evolving human being. That's, that's just, you know, working on myself, but I think about that and I think about it as an extension. So it's like when I'm in my studio, you know, maybe things I'm not like there having this like Zen moment all the time. I mean, sometimes things aren't going very well. And I sort of find myself, you know, wrestling. I, I described it as wrestling with a painting where I'm like, you know, <laughs> like sometimes it's all beautiful and it's really wonderful and I'm in the flow and it's the process and, and sometimes it's hard. And I think that's probably true of, of many things when they're not going sort of the way that you want them to, but maybe they kind of want to go in a different direction. So I think of it as contemplative practice because I think of it as a process. I think of it as um, a practice as something like, um, I borrow a lot of words from Sanskrit, and um, uh, one of the ones that I love is this idea of uh, svadhyaya, which is self-study. And so I, I take myself as and study myself, observe myself when I'm in the studio, observe what my hands are doing, what my body is doing, what's happening with the work in front of me, even if it's, you know, sitting and staring at paintings that, that I've got on the wall and sort of saying, are they working? What do they need? 
what are they saying? What are they doing? Um, so yeah, I think I think of it more as a, an, exten an extension of contemplative practice. Well, for me, uh, <clears throat> I never thought at the beginning about it, the spirituality part of this, um, but when I did my, I was very, very curious about pre-Columbian cultures and ancient cultures and their beliefs. And when you are in front of a monument or a piece like that, you have that interconnection that is, I would say spiritual. So my work, my beginning of my work was like, that and here in Colombia for undergrad they make you write a thesis when you are undergrad and oh my god it was like reading books and insane I have a philosopher in my team I had a sculptor in my team I had a ceramics artist on my team and it was this of reading and trying to begin to find where my connections were and where my work connected with it so it began to be more about that presence, that transcendence, that thing. And then I went to Georgia State for my master's because we, you cannot have a master's here in art. So that was the idea to go there and learn all the techniques and stuff that we don't have here. So, but we were going to come back and it didn't happen. <laughs> so when I was there, I started building these things that I kind of like still had that thing in my head. And my professor was like, you have a lot of eyes in your piece and, and it's like holes and, and things like that. And it's like, that is the eye, there is an eye in there. And I was like, really? And then I started looking at all my projects and in reality it was like a void, a hole um, and everything. And then it came time to write your thesis again, but now in English, I was like, oh my God, <laughs> I'm going to express myself in another language because in your own language, you kind of like feel that you have the structure, the power, and how you can communicate to someone reading it in another language where you don't feel that when you say something, you don't feel that strength, like even in your tone, you can communicate more than the word. So he said something uh, about um, the eyes are the window of the soul. Mm. And that was the title of the show. And I began like, translating part of what I did in my undergrad and now seeing it in my grad work. And that rolled the ball for a very long time. Um, and I wrote a poem in Spanish. <laughs> and then, but the poem with the time has been growing. Like I've been adding things as I've been growing. So it has, it talks about transcendence. It doesn't talk about a specific spirituality. It's like, inner soul, inner spirit. And I think that not only us, but nature has its own spirit. So it's not about a religious thing because like, yeah, I was raised a Catholic, but it's not that it's like more the universal kind of like quest, personal quest that we go through. Doesn't matter what name or label you put on it, but it has been more about that part. And now like I included the other series. The first one was the awakening series that I worked that long and I still work with it. But the other ones has been like the cosmic series or nature, elements of nature series. Like how all of those different things have a place in all of that cycle that we are in. So that is how I see it. Yeah, I love hearing. Uh, yeah, I love hearing what you're both saying, and I can relate on a lot of levels. Um, yeah, there's sometimes, a lot of times, in in the studio where the work is, I, I would equate it to labor. You know, it's hard physical work. Um, I make, you know, sometimes smaller components that build a larger space, or sometimes large components, and so it's. Um, it's, it's physical, it's demanding, it's labor. Um, but then there are the quieter moments, there are the contemplative moments, the reflective moments, the, the, um, the moments, you know, there's this, this term, uh, guarlingo, which is, it's, it refers to the moment before a uh, clock ticks like that. And so think about um, sort of like 
the moments leading up to actually beginning the work and what like how things are resonating and filtering through before there's actually the choice to put hand to material and start to make something. And so I think there's there's something there that's sort of beyond um, cognitive. And, um, and then in the experiencing the finished work, I've, you know, as my work has evolved over time, the installations continue to grow to where they're now kind of spaces that one can enter. And so I've been really thinking a lot about what's the language that describes what those spaces are. And, um, you know, there's some part of me that hesitates to eat. You know, it's hard to kind of talk about this sometimes because I don't want to be like presumptive about my own work and what it's what it's doing in the world. And um, but I can sort of have an indication of what I hope it's doing in the world. So sometimes I think like maybe uh, I aim to be creating little sanctuary spaces, you know, spaces that are quiet and like maybe they're hard because the material is hard, but maybe they're soft because the feeling that you get inside is soft. But in any case, just sort of like creating these opportunities for a reflection in some way. So it, it, I think I may have lost what even the original question was, but I think what I'm getting at is that the, the um, I think it was the question of like spirituality in the work and, and connecting that that word. And I think that sort of, it, it sort of appears and disappears throughout the, in various points of the process, you know, it, where it reveals itself and then it kind of dissolves and reveals itself and dissolves. I love this. I, I really resonate with what both of you have said and that I feel like the, when my work is successful, it's, it's a reflection of the attempt to create sense of inner spaciousness, right? So in some ways, like what, what you're expressing doing Rachel and also what you're expressing doing Maria is like, we're creating these things that go off into the world. And, and hopefully uh, because of our intent, they, they offer somebody else viewing or physically experiencing them or encountering them to, to have some sense of that inner spaciousness. And that's when I think about spiritual practice or contemplative practice, as I often refer to it, it's, it is, you know, it, for me, it originated from dealing with anxiety and depression. And it, it's, it's a still about that ongoing exploration of how do I create more space inside myself? And by creating more space inside myself to hold everything that's happening, I create pieces that do something similar for other people. And I, it's so powerful when you hear from somebody that your work has had that kind of impact on them, that it's that it's, you know, something that makes them feel calm or has helped them deal with loss or, you know, I also think that there's the very strong thread of like a, a narrative thread that runs through my work. And I kind of hear elements of that in both of your work as well. Although the story isn't a story that we tell with words necessarily, right? It's some... And it's not even like, it's a story that's open-ended for other people's um, experience. Yeah, that is Absolutely. true. And, and, and what is interesting is the age group. Like, what do they see and how they perceive your work? You know, like younger people, older people, uh, different cultures, they, they perceive things in such a way that you are even surprised sometimes and shocked. And is, you are like, oh, uh, uh, where, how this happened? So it, there is something that, somehow it's kind of magical, I will say, that happens in that part. And also when they comment, it's like opens your head and goes like, oh my God, I didn't see that. And I, it was like mind blowing, you know, like you go and you go like, but that is true as well. So it's, it's very, very interesting to see the perception from other people. So it's, it's, it's very moving. Yeah, I think, isn't that what, making art is about right is to create an opportunity for the viewer to bring all of their own experiences and their own identity and their own space where they are in that moment and feel how your work reflects into them and into that 
and yeah, watching, you know, watching children interact with work is just so beautiful and pure and honest. And, and then watching people who come with a particular weight or, or burden that they carry and how, how they reflect into the work. And yeah, it's, it's astounding, you know, and that's, I think something that sort of keeps, keeps me going and making, right. It's like just seeing the variety of ways that work can impact other people. Yeah, I, it's funny because, um, you know, Kelsey and Kelly and I work together on this series and we bring artists together and we try to create as diverse a field of process and materials as possible so that we can have these really interesting connections and and learn as we, you know, in, in, in introductions. Um, and it occurs to me too that y'all's work is so, um, so individual and yet it, they all of them have created room for nonverbal connection <laughs> with them, you know, through abstraction, through symbolism, through placement, <laughs> you know, um, and that through like, forging through and it's not because there isn't narrative or verbal ideation that leads you to the work that you create but the result of your work creates a, a space where you can kind of get out of your prefrontal cortex when you experience it where you, you get out of the part of your brain that processes language and you go into the part of your brain that processes feeling or emotion um and in meaning making so. That idea of what making does for folks in their brain, especially if you're dealing with something more repetitive or seemingly monotonous. I know for me, it can almost give like a really deep breath and an open void for like, you know, anything that's really weighing on me to just kind of spread out flat and find its space, you know? I'm, sh I'm interested in how that kind of manifests for y'all because I'm sure it's different for everyone. So you're talking about the actual process of making itself, like how we experience that. I think of it as a flow state, you know, that, um, you know, you can set up, set up the, this uh, circumstance in which you can then experience this flow state. Um, there's an artist named Meredith Monk, which some of you may be familiar with. And she talks about um, art making as a bodhisattva activity. You know, that there's this, this uh, process that we're, we're going through that we do very much in order to bring this, this thing into the world. Um, I know for me that uh, the way that I work is time consuming and material heavy. Um, it's definitely not the least expensive way to work. I'm thinking of you, Maria, with your process. Um, I will put so much encaustic medium onto a panel and the larger panels then get quite heavy, but it's because I lose myself in the process of building the layers and the layers have to be smooth. So I'm spending as much time with a torch as I am with a brush and the way I hold my brush, um, you know, when I'm when I'm working and building layers, I'm having to get them very smooth. So I'm very engaged in the process of looking at what I'm doing and then responding to what's in front of me. And this can be hours before I actually start painting. So I don't typically start with an idea of what I'm going to do. Um, and then I, I find it, it evolves as, as I'm working. Um, and as I'm working, if I lose track of where I'm at, or I you know notice that my shoulders are like up here, then I have to kind of bring my shoulders back down. I have to come back into my breath. I have to notice what's literally happening in that moment. Um, I had a really great conversation with uh, my friend Ruchu um, a few weeks ago about um she's working on a series called yoma which is like yoga meditation and art and so we were kind of talking about how these topics intersect and um i was sharing with her um a project that i worked on last summer through the american craft council bringing some craft uh, materials to um some underserved population of children in atlanta and what the, the reaction was, what the response was. And one of the projects was a weaving project. And so there's, um, you know, this, this in and out movement when you're weaving, right? This like, especially the, there's a little cardboard loom. So it's really active in and out, up and down. 
And so um, just thinking about what what that does in in the mind that that back and forth back and forth and then just thinking about isn't that exactly what meditation is right when we talk about meditation we talk about coming to the breath and we talk about you know to begin accessing you do something as simple as noticing breath moving in and out up and down and um and so it's just such it's it you know when i say it out loud it kind of sometimes sounds really simple and obvious but I think it's important to just sort of state that out that there is, you know, in that activity, activity of the hand is also an activity of the mind is also an activity of the breath and is all working to access this different place. Um, and then I liked hearing what you were talking about in the way that you're working. And it almost feels like, like a stream of consciousness or something, you know, where it's like one thing leads to the next leads to the next. And when I think about that in, in writing, it's kind of, it feels like it can be kind of immediate because you just go on and go on and go on. But when you're working in material, there's like, you have to kind of get to a point and then go back and get to the next point. And so I've, I found myself in a state where I'm like, oh, I'm going to do a series of three of this thing. And then next thing I know, I've got like 20 because it's just like one thing we, you know, just sort of, you just like carry that thread. And um, I think that can be, it's like, a really long meditation right can go on for for weeks just carrying that one thread across i know we touched on this a little bit before um, folks joined us on live but can y'all talk a little bit about how spirituality in art is sometimes tiptoed around and how you navigate those discussions when you're presenting your work or when you're teaching students uh, well, for me, I, I have been teaching for a long time, since 2004, uh, college. And before that, I taught high school and all of that. Um, it's a learning process, I would say. Um, and I learned that being an open-minded person and leaving the floor open to give opinions uh, is the best way because uh, we learn from each other. You know, in the classroom, you get so surprised and the students have taught me so much more than I think I have taught them uh, because they come with different ideas, different perspectives, different points of view that I think you just, you know, like open and it's like if you are talking about a religious piece of art, you are giving it context, but it's not a personal thing. It's not me imposing anything. It says in this period of time, this happened, blah, blah, blah. And the students will go, oh, that is so crazy, you know, like, uh, they will come up with that. And I think being relaxed and not imposing anything and leaving the floor open for conversation and dialogue is so important these days. And especially with the things that we are living, like you mentioned at the beginning, what would happen in Atlanta, I think the more educated and more aware we are of the other and more we see the other one as a human being, I think is the most important thing. And everybody will have perspective not everybody has to be religious you know like it's just if we dismystify it and have openness and pure heart to talk about I think that will give us more understanding where the other ones are coming from so for me it's like I said like a lot of topics I didn't know you know like I didn't grow up in certain cultures or things that has happened you know like uh, like uh, in here in Colombia, we have more a different, uh, I would say it's more a social status because we have so much racial mixture in our country. So it's a different thing. And when I go to the United States and I go to the South, it's a whole different thing. So coming from another country allows you to like realize how, you know, like the diversity of thought of everything, but we are all human beings. And I think we need to recognize the humanity on everyone to be able to heal what's going on and, and try to be open-minded to listen and to see where we are making mistakes, where we are wrong in our conceptions and have that, that sense of humanity to anyone. I think uh, and being open and there are people that are going to be very stubborn or, you know, they're going to hold their positions, but have the openness to talk in the classroom, I think is important. And the openness to talk about our own way of doing art and our spiritual way 
it's not imposing it anyone. It's saying, here I am, this is what I am doing and you are free to like it or not agree with it or whatever, you know? Yeah, that discomfort I think is a really wonderful opportunity to investigate your own growth, right? Yeah. What do y'all think? I think, I think what uh, some of what you said really resonates for me, Maria, I think, you know, when I first started teaching the first mo many years of teaching is really about learning, actually, you know, it's like, I worked with, a, when I first started teaching, I was teaching narrative collage, I wasn't teaching encaustic, and I was working, I was bringing it into a lot of different communities. So working with women vets and working with refugees and all kinds of groups, and just, um, reading the feedback forms and seeing how I could be a better teacher. So it wasn't even, this is, this is, this part of my life wasn't something that I brought into the classroom. But I think what really shifted things for me is um, a number of years ago, I gave a presentation at um, the International Encaustic Conference, which takes place each year in Provincetown. And it was my first time presenting in front of a big audience like that. And I was being videotaped at the same time. And I was up on the stage and I was quite nervous about it and I had written some notes out to myself, but primarily I had said, you know, go slow, breathe, be okay with silence. And um, because I had observed uh, whenever, well, that's what I resonate with in an instructor. And I wanted to leave room for that. And I knew that if I was nervous, I was probably more likely to talk too fast and fill all the space, like, like a painting that's too complicated for me. And um, when, when I was finished and students came up or people that were in the audience came up to me, I found that what resonated primarily even more than the content was um, the space that I created to share the information. That, that was something that they were really drawn to and that, open my eyes to think about how can I bring some of the concepts in, in yoga we talk about yoga off the mat and the whole purpose of doing yoga is yoga off the mat which is how we take this union with ourselves and with the divine out into the world and it's much more important than what you do in your own little practice on your mat and so um, over the last couple of years I started a blog and that's where I share my writing and my thinking and that sort of started to bleed into my classes and it's where I take things that I observe in my classes or ideas um, things like Sanskrit words that are really resonant that are also applicable to art making. So I'm thinking of, and I shared some of these, I think with Deborah, but um, the uh, idea of self-study. So Svadhyaya, which is a Sanskrit word meaning self-study is this idea of observing ourselves. And so I think self-observation of ourselves as we're making, right? So watching what's happening, noticing what's coming up in our bodies, um, responding to what's happening in the moment, that's, uh, I think a lot of it's about observation and looking and observing and not judging. Um, sometimes I'll even encourage students not to make a painting, not to try and make a painting at all. Uh, what I found is that so many of my students are really incredibly hard on themselves. They're quick to judge their work. They, um, they're, they're judging it even while it's in the process of being made. And so if there's something that I can give them, a lot of times it's just by being present with them. But uh, sometimes these, these uh, words that I can find and share um, are, I think, very helpful to them. And so, you know, it may not be that spirituality as a topic comes up in the classroom, but I think more where I found that I'm communicating it and sharing it with my audience is through writing. And, um, yeah, that helps me clarify my thoughts. Yeah, for me, it's been, um, I've kept these things really separate for the most part. You know, it's like I'm an artist on the one hand and sort of a yoga practitioner, sometimes teacher on the other hand. And even though, like I said earlier, I was doing both of them at Aramont, wasn't talking about the the connectivity of, of the two. It was like, you can come visit me in my studio. You can come to my yoga class like they're very separate and um and but as I mentioned too in the beginning there's it's like you you can't help being who you are <laughs> and you can't you know you really can't separate at a point it just it, it all merges um as we go on and I uh yeah be before we opened up the 
the webinar we were talking about how, you know, oftentimes if I'm presenting work, I kind of scan over pieces that are deeply rooted in um, my spiritual beliefs. And because I, I think, you know, sort of like what Maria was saying, like I kind of didn't, I didn't want to offend anyone and want to put my opinions on top of someone, but wh why, you know, what, why, why was I, what's the fear of that? Um, just sharing a, a piece of my process and and my thoughts. And um, and then it was also relating to what Dylan was saying about giving a presentation and where it the the two have merged is when I'm speaking about my work in order to bring myself into presence and be prepared, I'll often ask the people I'm speaking to to stand up, to reach their arms up, take a breath, you know, just move their bodies and and come and come into this shared space together. I think that's something that's just so important um, when connecting with other people, whether it's in a lecture or in a in a studio classroom, to just remember that we're all, you know, there's no hierarchy, you know, to just come into that shared space together and just kind of join. Yeah, and um, just riffing off that for a moment, I also, um, I've started teaching yoga as part of my workshops. Like, like you were saying that you you have done that, but kind of kept them separate. And um, I run a retreat each year and I teach, not everybody signs up for the yoga, but I do, I teach yoga in the morning before we go on to the um, workshop. And it's, it just got to the point where I couldn't keep those things separate in my life anymore, you know? And so anytime I have the opportunity, it doesn't always work with, with a given workshop setting. And some people are really just interested in the art making practice, or they're not comfortable with yoga, or they don't think they have the right kind of body to do yoga or whatever they think it is. But, um, I, I think for me, I, I have to stay connected to my body when I'm working. Like, so if I, if I find that I'm not in my body connected to my breath, if I don't, you know, if I'm not like feeling my feet on the ground and noticing what's happening with my shoulders and my body, then, um, I need to get back to that place. And, um, and so I've noticed that there's a di different kind of bonding when I can bring that in that, um, it allows people to bring their whole self to the space. If they're comfortable with yoga and that they are interested in doing that, um, as part of the workshop, then, they have a very different experience of the workshop. They, that affects their art making practice, even if it's not something that they regularly do, which isn't an endorsement. Like not everybody needs to do yoga. It's just one way of being in the world. It's one way of experiencing your body and being in your body. It can be, your practice can be anything. Yeah, I just feel like whatever it takes to make you feel whole at right. one time. Yeah. And can, yeah, and connected to yourself. Mm -hmm. Well, y'all, we've got some really awesome, I've got a couple more questions, but we've got even better viewer questions. So I'm going to go straight to those. So Susanna asks, do you have meditation practices that you use during your time in the studio to stay focused or calm outside anxieties? Well, I will say I generally don't, but the incredible part for me is like, uh, I just expanded my studio in my house and it's under the deck and it has a lot of windows. Mm. And sometimes for me, you know, like I have like the inner part of the studio where it's a little bit more darker, but I've noticed like all, during all this past year, for me just walking through the door and having the sunlight, even if it's a dark day or whatever, but having so many windows and seeing nature and seeing nature keeps going. And I see the birds and I see the grass and sometimes my dogs go out and I just enter that space and I feel, sometimes I'm not conscious about it, but I feel a switch, kind of like something clicks. And I like, I don't do yoga. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I think I will try sometime, but uh, I don't do it, but just entering the space. Sometimes you have that space where you see the continuum kind of like thing. And sometimes maybe I'm not in a good place, you know, like it's not like you always are like, oh, I'm relaxed and I'm going to start painting or doing. Sometimes you are like your inner thoughts, your day by day, your worries, your stuff. And then I start working on something and because I'm thinking on that process, but I'm sometimes processing 
those thoughts, those worries, those anxieties. And I've been like, this past year, I've been, you know, like listening to podcasts that are spiritual, that they are opening my mind, um, audiobooks. Like, I like to work with my hands, kind of like, I think this is my therapy, I will say. Plus, listening to other things and opening my mind of what else or how can I rethink things. Um, or sometimes quiet or sometimes just relaxing music. The whole staying there, doing, working, even if I'm worried. I am in a better place than I am if I am sitting worried in a chair inside of the house. Like there is a, a process, somehow it gets digested, sometimes slowly, sometimes easier, sometimes faster, but I am in a better emotional and mental place after I work. I think that, um studios for artists are so much like altars to me like when you walk into someone's studio space you are walking into their sacred space you know whether they consider it to be that or not I really think that they are just giant altars for making <laughs> I, I totally agree Kelsey and that's something that I encourage my students to think of their space even when you know some of them will say well it's at home or it's my studios in the basement or it's this or it's that or it's you know, you know it's it's not the big gorgeous studio that you have or whatever i just say how can you make that space sacred how can you make it feel do you want to light a candle do you want to cl clean it i use cleaning as a spiritual practice to be honest with you i love to clean and um, i do have a yoga mat in my studio but equally i love to put on loud music and dance sometimes sometimes it's podcasts like maria said um, sometimes, you know, it's just sitting down. I have chairs everywhere to encourage myself to sit down because I often will not sit down all day otherwise. Um, so there's not like a specific spiritual practice, but I think about that thinking of your space as sacred, regardless of where it is. My first studio was a corner of my living room, you know? Yeah, I really love um, what Maria was saying about tuning into nature. I think especially in this past year, as things have really just turned upside down in our, our world in so many ways, just tuning in and noticing that nature is a rhythm that keeps moving and we're a part of nature. And so we can also keep moving. And, um, and also in terms of sort of how I keep my mind, like I really think about, I know that whatever I'm thinking about, whatever I'm feeling, is going to be in the work that I'm making. And so that's really a good practice for me to shed negative thoughts, to sort of move move some of that, you know, those like critical um, ideas out of my mind or, you know, just sort of like help move pain through. And um, because I don't want that to be living in the work that I put in the world in as much as is possible. I've got another question from our viewers and y'all touched a little bit on this, but I'm, I'm interested to hear y'all expand. Um, have you always felt open um, to others about the connection between spirituality and your work? Or have there been times where you felt like you shouldn't or couldn't express your spirituality in the context of your art? You know, I don't think that I don't think that I have a hang up about talking about the role of um, my interests in spirituality or poetry or any of that. Uh, I think that there is a divide sometimes between your public and your personal self. And I, I think more what I've struggled with is like how deeply personal work is sometimes and then it then is going to go out into the world. I've even struggled with this just around titling. And, you know, I love when other artists title their work and it's like very deeply personal or poetic. And then I, I really struggle with that myself, which is why my titles are often just one word. So like, I don't think that talking about it is hard. I think that there's, I think it's within the work itself. There's something that I still struggle with about sharing my inner self, but it isn't about, it isn't about, um, I have no problem talking about spiritual practice. I, I feel like my connection to, to spiritual practice, or I, I use the word more contemplative practice, um, has been life-saving. And it's something that I think can, sh by sharing it, I help other people, but not in a way that pushes anything on them, just by opening the conversation. Um, 
more that way. Yeah, I really think of it um, as an invitation to participate on that level. Um, there was an image when I was talking earlier of um, a labyrinth that I had built. And so the borders were all these um, slipcast porcelain stones, so hollow, very fragile. Um, and I, you know, I mean, the labyrinth is an ancient form. I didn't invent it. And, and it has magic that I simply um, tried to draw in through its its being, you know, by recreating one. So I don't give myself credit for anything that happened in it, other than just that I put it in a particular place at a particular time for the people who were there. But um, another element was I had made all these small porcelain pebbles and invited people to carry them in and out with them. And, you know, a labyrinth is a very personal journey. And, um, but for people who were who were in the park that that weekend and weren't familiar with it or wanted to sort of engage in an art experience but didn't know what a labyrinth was I just sort of gave them an invitation if you would like to consider this thing as you travel in and this other thing as you travel out this is my invitation to you so really trying to just offer something without forcing it has been my approach mm -hmm. yeah for me it's um is just let them experience and see what they feel. And they want to open the conversation and talk to me and ask me about it. I will give my, where, where I'm coming from, but exactly, it's not an imposition. It's like, this is me, this is what I think. And, you know, uh, and sometimes people are very open and interested and ask more questions. So, you know, curiosity is a great thing. We learn so much from each other about, what we see and like, I haven't met Rachel or I don't know how to pronounce your name. <laughs> <laughs> Daitlin. Daitlin. Uh, but just seeing and like hearing them now, I am like, oh my God, yeah, I can see a lot of these things and I can see the space, the installation, the experience to be present in the moment. And I bet you, you can be in an installation two different days where you are in a different state of mind or a spiritual mm -hmm. being that you have different experiences. So I think it's the openness. It's not necessarily imposing anything. And people want to know we are willing to open ourselves. We are open ourselves already doing art and putting it out there. Mm -hmm. So it's already an opening of what we are experiencing, but it's not imposing anything at all. You know, when I taught narrative collage, um, I emphasized a lot of like, um, we're exploring the stories that we're carrying, right? We all have these stories, these stories of our lives, these experiences. And so we're bringing that to our work. And in, in narrative collage, we were using image and text to tell a story. But even with abstract painting, it's the same thing. We're like, and this is what said earlier, but like we bring our whole selves to that experience. So it's all these subtle ways that you can I think invite people to participate in that experience of bringing their whole self and what they're interested in exploring in in the classroom. I have another um, I have another question from the audience from Jan. Um, she asks if you can speak a little bit to the spirit of your chosen materials. Like, do you feel connected to that? Yes. <laughs> I feel very strongly about that. And I think about it all of the time and I write about it and I share about it and it's very deeply important to me. And um, we touched a little bit on it earlier about the, the Rollo May quote, which is, um, he talks about what he calls social courage. And he's really talking about relationships um, between two people where he says, when you enter into, if you enter fully into a relationship, like a chemical mixture, neither of you will come out unaffected. And, um, and so I think about that, you know, in the studio, it's like, as an artist, it's easy to think, oh, I, I'm going into the studio and I am influencing my material, right? I am in control, I am in power, I am doing the thing to the material. But I believe that as an artist, if you go fully into that relationship with your material and with your practice, that you will be changed as well, right? It's not only I'm changing, this lump of porcelain into an object. It is changing my being because I have, to, in order to be in the relationship, I have to behave in a particular way. If I'm too rough, I will destroy what I'm making. And so that influences the way that I behave. And then 
it's impossible, as we've been saying, to separate that out. Like when I leave the studio, I just don't turn into like the bull in the china shop, right? I have to, I, that sort of just becomes um, my being. And then in terms of, I guess the question really was more about the spirit of the material itself. And um, I mean, porcelain has such a deep history and in some places a dark history that it carries with it, but it's, this, it's very mysterious, right? It is opaque, but it is also luminescent in particular ways. And that is something that I really think a lot about. Like, if can I be like porcelain? Can I absorb light and can I reflect light? And I think that's really what it is, one of the deepest things that the material is teaching me. Can I both absorb and reflect light in the world? Well, for, for me, I, I work with tons of different materials, but I've been always since a little kid, like I would sit down in a dirt road in front of the farm, you know, like they have like rocks and teeny tiny things. And I will spend time, you know, like in the road, like, Grabbing and going like, oh, look at these little quartz, you know, like and collecting those tiny things. So I don't know. I have like probably and, and I know I, I did ancestry and I have like a lot of Indian, uh, native Indian in my blood. And I think I have the gatherer thing of gathering things all the time. Mm -hmm. I'm just like walking and it's like, oh, that cute little stick <laughs> or <laughs> you know, like that little rock or you know, like moss, you know, like the moss that falls from the trees or like all that, I am enchanted by it. So like in mosaic and everything, like I've been able to like grab materials or um, now lately I learned a technique of doing pieces of resin that you can use as mosaic pieces. And now I am encapsulating items, kind of now like I want to in more eyes, like stop time, embedded in there, like they are like sacred, like they are, full of inner energy like they are there and how can I put them together to express themselves and to express life to express spirituality to express essence energy and uh, lately my daughter my two daughters they are artistic as well and they were saying oh mom why don't you take you know like I did one with a little uh, shells and everything why don't you take them to nature and photographed them there and I was like oh my god that is a great idea so I went and put them in a creek and I put it in a creek and I started looking at the water running through them and it was like a spiritual ritual experience kind of like I took elements from nature or that were not from nature put them together and went back to nature that was like <laughs> mind-blowing so <laughs> so I I love uh what the elements have and how you can make so many different versions of it, so. Yeah, I don't think so much about the spirit of the physical material that I'm using, um, but I do feel very connected to it and I'm very aware that it is, um, I'm working with literally bees wax, like bees wax and tree resin, and then also this alchemical process of transforming it through heat, through flame. Um, and I think that there's, I, I think one thing I'm very conscious of and, and, you know, struggle with, I think also is using materials, you know, creating the, the things that, <laughs> that, that the stuff we throw away as artists and what we consume as artists. But um, encaustic is, is just really an incredible material. It's, it's luminous. If it's it, like you were saying, Rachel, it's opaque, but it has, a, you can use it in a way that um, allows you to create translucency. You can, um, you can use it in a sculptural fashion. So you can build it up and carve into it. You can look down through it. I'm very interested in work that looks like it's reflecting something in nature as well. Like, so a lot of my pieces might look like um, you're looking down into a pond, but there's clouds and there's wind and there's other things reflected on the surface. And there just is no other paint that I could use that would allow me to do something like that. So I feel very like connected to the physicality of it, the way it goes on, the way I fuse it, how I carve into it. It's, it's not like oil or acrylic paint. Maria, I get really tickled thinking about you sitting in a dirt road, picking up all the rocks and being <laughs> in all of them. My, my good friend, 
also is very in awe of the tiniest things that she finds on the ground and she calls them tiny completes and I love it <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was that was like I'm looking at me like why are you doing that but the sad part why is like, aren't you doing that <laughs> no but the sad part is like I had my collection and for me were so special and one day I come from school and my mom threw them all away they were gone mm -hmm. No, yes, oh. they're going on to live new lives. So hopefully, someone else will find them. That's all them. Those are not rich lives. <laughs> <laughs> well, y'all, do y'all have any final thoughts on this topic? Anything at all? It has been so wonderful to speak with y'all today. I just want to really thank Aramont for putting this series together and for inviting us to talk about this. Um, really potent um, topic and um, just what a gift it's been to speak with these other two brilliant artists and um, and Maria I just want to share that um, I'm so moved by um, I'm like gonna cry because it's, <laughs> it's like so moving to me that you um, your way of taking uh, violence and um, aggression and flipping it and approaching it with tenderness and and sort of um, the flipping that I think that that's um, so important right now is um, is finding the tender places finding the places of connection finding um, a knowingness that you know, we all share this world and, and how can we be together in it and um, to just flip those narratives, um, I think is so, so important. And, um, and Dietland, it's been such a joy to, to hear you speak here. Um, as, as a fellow yogi, I just really enjoy um, hearing the depth of your knowledge and your practice and your experience and how you share it out into the world and through your art and through your teaching. It's really, really been a joy. Thank you. Yeah, it's been really wonderful to hear y'all speak to all of your practices. And I hope that for everyone that has watched today that maybe they step into their studio with a little more vulnerability and, and a little more wholeness. Um, thank y'all so much for being here and sharing your time with us um, and your practices and yeah, it's just been really wonderful. Um, I don't have a lot more words. I have to really marinate on all of this. It's been so wonderful to be here with y'all. Um, thank you for everyone at home that tuned in uh, with us today and asked amazing questions and had great conversations in the chat bar. Um, keep these conversations going. They're really important. Dietlin, Maria, Rachel, thank you so much again for being here. Um, have a good rest of your weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity and thank you to all. And I hope that we can meet soon in person. <laughs> Me too. Me too. Y'all check out these ladies classes online. Registration is open. Um, come take a workshop. It's going to be magical. All right. Thank Bye. you. Take care. Thank you.